So, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to uh, see you this morning, and I expect a few more will be coming in. I wanted to begin, as I typically do, with a bit of a retrospective on um, the set of materials that we saw and covered yesterday before going on to a lot of exciting material today, most notably with additional case studies related to um, the main topic of focus yesterday, which was particle filtering. And then extending particle filtering uh, in a key way with the capacity to estimate parameters. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, this, this is naturally helps stimulate uh, some additional comments on my part um, regarding the material yesterday, this plan of ours today. So, firstly, um, many people in the room uh, we'll be familiar with the fact that often when we're building dynamic models, these models which, which characterize complex systems, um, whilst we have access to, um, to uh, information, understanding that may be fairly confident in some areas of model assumptions, assumptions about parameter values and assumptions about structure, there's often some spheres where our knowledge is less good. Um, in some cases, we build, uh, pursuant to the question from theory I answered yesterday, in some cases, we build models to build theory. We're, we're engaged in theory building with models. And often there, we build models that are, are simpler, decidedly simpler, to, to sharpen our thinking about how just, say, a few factors might interact to explain patterns that we see in the world, or if, if they interact in that way, what the implications would be for certain types of uh, interventions. Um, in short, we engage in modeling for theory building. Um, these are often stylized models, and I rattled off a whole bunch um, uh, yesterday morning, I believe. Um, in addition to that, there's a broad class of dynamic modeling we pursue for theory explication. We have some theory, be it well-established or be it a competing theory, a theory that's jockeying for position with others, and we build models around that theory. But often even then, even if it's very well-established theory, for a particular context that we may be simulating with a given model, sometimes we uh, come up short. Typically, we come up short with respect to certain assumptions, certain data items. And one common way of dealing with this that is, is part and parcel of standard model operation is um, parameter estimation in the form of what's sometimes known as calibration. Sometimes it's just known bluntly as parameter estimation or automated parameter estimation. Sometimes it's referred to informally as parameter tuning. Um, but the, the basic picture is we're, we're trying to, uh, we have certain parameters where we have a degree of uncertainty about them. And uh, while we have data that might inform other parameters um, or, or understanding from the literature, maybe it's understanding from the secondary literature, maybe it's understanding from primary data, maybe it's understanding from meta-analyses that have been uh, performed um, uh, maybe it's, it's estimates drawn from experience or practitioners in our areas. Often there are certain parameters we don't know as well, and for those parameters, um, uh, we try to take advantage of what some additional knowledge we have in the form of um, data about model behavior as a whole, or large portions of a model. And the idea here is that data can't be used to just deduce what, the value of any one parameter because it's, it's from a tangled system where what affects that observed data about the world, about system behavior more broadly, is not just one parameter. It's not just one aspect of the system. It's an entangling of a bunch of aspects of the system. So we can't go from that data about the world, say, for a number of incident cases over time, and go to any one parameter, say, the, the transmission rate and expect to come up with a, an estimate for that parameter in isolation. Because the incident cases over time is affected by parameter 8, surely, but it's affected by a lot of other things. And 
it's not in the nature of the entanglement to just go from incident case count and saying, oh, the transmission rate is that, or the contact rate is that. We can't do it generally. So what we do in these cases is try to make use of that data in another way. We try to build a model that will match those observed patterns as closely as possible. And we do so by building a model that, as a dynamic model, produces emergent behavior, say, about incident cases over time. And we adjust the assumption about, say, transmission rate such that that model outputs data that is as closely matched to the empirical data as possible. That doesn't necessarily mean it matches every the vagaries of every bit of the time series, but it, it may capture salient patterns like cumulative case count or, or overall incidence rate. It might capture the interpeak spacing between that observed data series and what we see uh, uh, what we see from the model, so, the, so what we see from the world and what we see from the model. It might capture distributional characteristics um, of, the, of the incident case counts we see in the world. It might capture things like the autocorrelation function from that. Um, and Wade is in fact working with an, uh, a quite articulate model of pertussis in Alberta where they're seeking to match some of these uh, several of these patterns from data in the world, recognizing that you know uh, models are not crystal balls, they are not soothsayers, and they can't predict the exact timing of every little um, uh, you know outbreak in a local community. But what they can be expected to do is to capture broad patterns or distributional characteristics from those observed data. So this process of taking some data to estimate particular parameters in isolation um, is a familiar one to everyone, but many will also be familiar with the second process of taking observed data that reflects emergent behavior from the world, behavior about that can't be reduced to any one parameter, and then trying to tune your assumptions about other less well-known parameters to match that emergent behavior, taking advantage of the fact that from the model, we have emergent behavior. From the world, we have emergent behavior. In each case, reflecting things going on in many areas of the system or model. And we try to match them as closely as possible by adjusting parameter assumptions. In short, we do parameter estimation by matching output from the model against corresponding data from the world. This is a process widely known as calibration or automated parameter estimation. And we do a tremendous amount of that in my group, um, and I know other people in the room, including Cheryl, have uh, pursued this um, extensively. And if anyone's interested in learning more about it, um, uh, I would suggest uh, you alerting me to that, and we might have a bit of time tomorrow to, to talk about that process. But. What we saw yesterday with particle filtering should, should remind you of this slightly, but, um, but with some differences that may be giving you pause. Yesterday we saw an approach in particle filtering that is not meant as a, as a parameter estimation approach. Particle filtering is an approach to estimate the latent state of the system over time the underlying state of this system in the world, not a, parameterization, not a parameter estimation uh, approach. This afternoon, we'll be getting into a variant of this, a parameter estimation approach as well, particle MCMC. But particle filtering by itself is not meant to be an approach to estimate the value of static parameters. But you'll notice that that qualifier word I just put in there, static parameters. Because the approach that we used yesterday can estimate model state, and if there are certain parameters that are changing over time as part of model state, like if we posit that the uh, reporting rate for, 
for cases of uh, influenza changes over time because perhaps as an outbreak grows, people grow increasingly concerned about what they would have brushed off as just yearly flu. They get concerned maybe that's a case of H1N1 and they're more likely to report it, to present for care just in case, right? To bring their child who's suffering a high fever instead of letting them recover at home, they bring them to the emergency room because they hear there's this type of flu going around this year that kills young people too, not just elderly, not just those who are suffering from immunocompromised conditions. So maybe the reporting rate fluctuates and one way to capture that is put the reporting rate in model state. And in which case, if it's part of model state, if it's an aspect of the situation that's evolving over time, even if it's in governed by factors we can't totally anticipate, we can then estimate it with particle filtering. And we saw a lot of cases of that yesterday, Chalian's model with measles and pertussis. Um, she estimated a number of parameters, like the contact rate, like the reporting rate, that would better explain the situation. And uh, those parameters underwent either directly or in a transformed form a random walk over time. We couldn't say exactly how they were going to change over time in some sort of principled way about processes governing them. But we basically took advantage of the fact that the particle filter could estimate them, even if they were undergoing a random walk, and might be able to pin down their values from piecing together the evidence that was available to us, the yearly and, and uh, weekly counts, and put it together, or sorry, in monthly counts, and put it together into a picture of what those parameters probably are at any one time, okay? So we saw that particle filtering can be used for estimating these dynamic parameters, these parameters that vary over time, as long as we let them vary as part of model state yesterday. We saw that. This afternoon, we'll be seeing how we use another method, MCMC, to sample from parameters without particle filtering. And then in the last part of today, we'll be getting into PMCMC, which will continue through a lot of tomorrow. Okay, so PMCMC combines particle filtering, that's the P, <laughs> particle, and with MCMC, that's the MCMC. Um, so it's particle MCMC. And we'll be examining a variant of this that's extraordinarily uh, practical and powerful that will let us estimate parameters we don't know um, about the model as a whole, these static parameters that carry the same value through the simulation, as well as estimating and particle filtering the latent state of the system, including any dynamic parameters. So it'll bring this method to its full potential. But yesterday we saw some powerful things that could be achieved by it. And when it comes to needs to estimate static parameters in a particle filtering model, it's not that we're out of options. We have plenty of options. They're just more typical options. They're things like calibrating those parameters together with particle filtering. And a very interesting thesis out of MIT in the 1970s argued cogently that actually, if you use a tool that's a filtering tool, like particle filtering, for example, to estimate the latent state of the system, so you, you have it guessing what's going on beneath the covers in terms of latent state and, and bringing that state into alignment with what data suggests from the world when it's out of whack. For example, the model can't anticipate magically which way stochastics will go. Right, about weather or about stochastics about the economy or stochastics about the vagaries of um, temperature for Chin Yang's model or, or moisture or precipitation, right? Models, it's not in the cards that our models will exactly predict how stochastics go. Yeah. And stochastics here with, with conditions like measles or pertussis are writ large in the post vax in the current era, right? Um, uh, outbreaks of measles in under-immunized communities in Alberta 
are often due to foreign travelers who bring back measles from the Netherlands or from some other higher incidence area, and they bring them back to their local community, which is under-vaccinated and therefore has a fertile place for spread. And we're not going to be able to predict exactly when someone from overseas is going to come. But we can have a model that will catch on quickly if that's happening, clue into the fact, and capture the fact that now the state of the model has been shifted from what we anticipated and, and learn from that. And that's what those particle filters modeling can do. So this thesis from MIT in the 1970s basically observed that if you have the ability to do that, if you have the ability to observe from data um, what situation we're in. Oh, we've actually got no cases again. There, almost certainly there's no cases out there. The model might have thought there, there was a decent chance of a small number of cases taken off from some wayward traveler, but it didn't happen. The model gets clued into that and it gets clued in over time when there is an outbreak early on so it will kick off the expectations of how it will evolve. If you have a model that's, th that's whose state estimate is informed by data and it's always estimating that state estimate, which is what part of the filtering does, it, uh, uh, estimates the underlying state. If you have a model like that, you can calibrate parameters much more accurately. You can actually arrive at through traditional calibration machinery, tuning that the assumptions about the static parameter. You can actually arrive at a much better estimate of those parameters in many in some conditions, and better estimate in many conditions than you would otherwise. Um, and it's because often we try to shoehorn into our parameters accommodation for a state that's changing stochastically. We try to fit it all into our parameters. But if we have a model that's savvy to the fact that it's off base, that, oh, I, I thought there'd be a few cases now, but there actually aren't, after all. If it can correct for that, it doesn't have to load all those corrections into parameter values. It can, it can um, be corrected where it's off base and have parameters that turn out to be much more savvy than in terms of their value. So particle filtering together with calibration is a formidable technique. And our second guest speaker yesterday, uh, Jan, when it came to mosquito models, um, is taking advantage of that in spades. And also, um, uh, Shayan had given a nod to that. And in fact, through people now in the room, through Zuru and through Olivia here, um, they are taking advantage of this fact by calibrating models that are particle filtering models to arrive at best estimates for parameters that are static parameters that don't vary during the simulation. And that's taking advantage of that MIT thesis from 40 years ago now, approaching 50 years ago, that, that basically says the parameter estimates that come out of that calibration will be better because it is a model that's kept, kept savvy to the actual situation, kept humble to realize it needs correction sometimes, and kept savvy to that external fluctuating situation which fluctuates according to stochastics it couldn't anticipate. And so um, when we do that, when we calibrate those models, we often do so to try to minimize the discrepancy. And Shen Yang mentioned yesterday, the huge benefit she's derived from that. Um, she had a model which of, of, of the um, mosquito population, trying to explain the empirical data that had a discrepancy, just this kind of root mean square discrepancy. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of measuring how far off the particles are as a whole, sort of if you look at the distribution from what what, the, what they would have suggested versus what the empirical data showed, it was around 1,000, which is not going to be a particularly uh, important number in and of itself. It's more the relative value compared to what I'll say. It was around 1,000, and last, uh, she had mentioned last night, it was down to about 117 with parameter tuning. In short, you can tune certain assumptions about the model in the form of static parameters so that the model behaves just a lot better 
in terms of its predictions. Taking advantage of the fact that, as always, with a particle filtered model, it will be clued in when it's off base and correct its understanding of what's going on in the world, in fact. It'll be able to self-correct from observations, which is hugely helpful in a world which has stochastics that we can't reasonably call a model to, to expect, right? It's just like you're walking home with your eyes closed um, for short periods of time, and you open them once every 30 seconds, and you realize better where you are, right? You realize, oh, I'm, I'm actually two meters short of where I thought I would be. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm uh, a few feet closer to the curb than I thought I'd be at this point. I'm glad I opened my eyes or else I would have gotten a sprained ankle, right? Um, if I continue walking further. Um, so it's kind of like uh, we're using particle filtering to every once in a while peek out using empirical data and correct our understanding of where we're at. And because of that, it turns out if you combine that with, with calibration, we, we arrive at better parameter estimates. Um, so this is a, a powerful feature of, um, of particle filtering that it can be used together with calibration in, in a way that yields better calibration results than would otherwise be the case, and, and yet um, uses particle filtering for that key advantage of cluing us in to system state um, when, it's, uh, when it's off base from, from what we would have thought. So yesterday we saw two great examples of this uh, from uh, Young's work and from, um, uh, from the work that uh, Sha Yan has done. Um, both happen to be in the area of um, infectious disease relevance. Young's is motivated by West Nile but she's really focused on mosquito populations at this point. That's, that's the focus. So it's, it's population dynamics for mosquitoes in light of observations that are highly imprecise and incomplete and affected by, in a big way, by confounders like weather-related factors. Meanwhile, um, uh, Xiao Yan's work focuses on transmission of childhood infectious diseases. And we'll see that taken to another level today, Chayanne's work, um, where she's going to show how combining multiple models of different conditions, conditions which don't affect each other directly in a significant way, um, say whether someone has measles or not, or, or, or chickenpox or not. Okay? Uh, if I have chickenpox, um, it doesn't really affect my likelihood of getting measles directly. It doesn't protect me from measles. It doesn't make me more likely to get measles um, over the course of my life, and vice versa. But what she's going to show is, by particle filtering with respect to chickenpox data, I can estimate certain things like the contact matrix, that how people are contacting each other, that will make it much easier to anticipate where measles might be going. So by learning from, meas learning from a time series about chickenpox with particle filtering, I can better estimate what, how the measles situation will develop and vice versa. So she's going to show how, how, in a model with two different conditions that have some overlapping risk factors here, contact patterns and, and between groups, we can we can estimate both diseases and where they might be going, anticipate where they might be going better than we can in isolation. These are two conditions which don't affect each other directly, but are affected by a common substructure, contact matrix, which is better estimated with either particle filtering, and if you do them together, you get a best of both worlds where you can anticipate measles better because you've been particle filtering chicken pox, and you can estimate chicken pox better because you've been estimating measles, and you get a much more savvy understanding of measles and chicken pox by doing them both. You can only imagine the number of other conditions that, that have common risk factors that could be simulated in this way, chronic diseases uh, amongst them. Um, and indeed, those in the room, um, uh, Zuru and Olivia, have been doing some wonderful work extending this to three 
three conditions at once um, and examining the impact on uh, on model performance, particle filtering performance. So a lot of a lot of exciting stuff there. Now we're going to have more on particle filtering and why it works uh, this morning. And I don't want to shortchange that by drawing out these comments, but I do want to just make a key observation. I've I've argued from the start that particle filtering is about learning about the system. What do you learn about? You learn about the state, the underlying state of the system over time. That's what we learn about in particle filtering. We have some system that's governed by some underlying dynamics, which we capture in a model. We posit what's driving that. And then we have observations from the world that we use to infer what that, and, and correct, as it were, that, that understanding of what the state of that underlying system is. There's two implications for this I just want to bring out now. One thing is, if that model of the world is off, it has inconsistencies in it, it's inherently as a simplification of the world, it leaves out factors. It's useful, like a map is useful because it leaves out certain details, allows us to focus on what's germane to our problem at hand. And so it is with a model. But part of that means that a model's going to be missing and oversimplifying and omitting and, and you know, um, misestimating certain parameters is part of it. Um, part of it's, it's uh, you know, part of it's, uh, its design is going to be leaving out factors that will have some impact. And it's going to be affected by a lot of other um, factors as well. Uh, that are stochastic we can't reasonably expect. And particle filtering helps us, helps us um, make up for these limitations. These are limitations that are essential for learning, but they are limitations in anticipating where things are going. And it's a limitation we don't have a crystal ball in the world to predict how stochastics will turn out. But part, a, a tool like particle filtering, just as much as peeking out as you're walking home every 15 or 20 seconds or looking up from your phone, perhaps more frequently, right? It will let you compensate for the fact that your mental model is off a little bit. You don't know when the street light will be changing and so on. It lets you, it clues you in um, to where you are uh, despite your mental model limitations, it clues you into where you are despite your not knowing the schedule for street lights or you know, when uh, the walk signal will be on, right? It makes up for our limits um, and lets us use a model to good stead nonetheless. It lets us use the model for projecting forward, for example, having been clued in when the model's been off base or you know, when it was, um, it didn't know what to expect stochastic-wise by, by cluing us in. So to some degree, particle filtering is a, it makes up for the limitations of our models. It lets us perform well despite our model limitations. And one of the consequences of this is that if it comes to a new emerging infectious disease, let's say SARS or MERS, or let's say um, you know H1 influenza when it first came out, um, you know uh, perhaps perhaps variants of eastern equine encephalitis in southeastern U.S. these days, or Zika virus, right? At the time those infections first emerge, or a new strain of them emerge, sometimes often we are grappling with little data, sometimes uncertainties about the infection? Is it transmitted vertically? To what degree are there asymptomatic carriers of the infection who spread it despite not being symptomatic? Maybe there's questions about its latency or incubation period. Maybe there's issues having to do with what its uh, transmission rate is. Typically, we're confronted with a wide variety of uncertainties. But at this time, when the outbreak is just starting, the calls and cries for help and planning to combat, to control that infection are some of the loudest. And it's most urgently in need of informing and learning quickly what's going on. Learning from evidence as quickly as possible because we're dealing with a big unknown, a big question mark. And we want to be set up in a position where 
you know, in this counterfactual situation, a situation that has never been observed previously, we want to be able to prize learning, fast learning. And the particle filter is there to help because we can build a rough and ready model often quite quickly. Um, you stick some of my students in a room and, and feed them well, and you know they can they can churn out for you models that probably are our first guesses that are not terrible, but we know they're limited, right? We know they're they're off base. They probably have omissions. They probably meant, miss certain factors that are important. But particle filtering provides us a way for to have those models um, stay current with the situation and to accommodate the fact that while that model may miss a certain pathway of transmission, it might still be useful for projecting forward for periods of time and estimating aspects of the underlying situation. And it provides us a way of calibrating parameters with greater reliability, um, per that thesis from 40 years ago. But beyond that, it provides us with uh, a fashion for arriving at a, an ongoing updated estimate for parameters, dynamic parameters that aren't well known, and the capacity to keep that model current with the latest emerging evidence in a way that lets us plan forward and ask about intervention mechanisms. It's not a silver bullet. And we don't want this to sh cut short the need to learn in a deeper way about how model structure needs to be adapted. But as I expressed to Dr. Sher Young earlier, um, I believe that you know, within the, the time frame of the next few years, what we're going to see coming out of it, I, I can assure you that it very likely will be coming out of our group if it doesn't come out of others first, is the capacity to use tools like we're going to be talking about today particularly particle MCMC, to actually adapt model structure reflecting what's observed. So to end up selecting, based on the data that's coming off, selecting model structure that better explains the data when you have a couple different ideas of what that structure should be and you're not sure which is the, the correct one. And of course, you could take even now with particle filtering multiple models and trial them out and see which of them best explain the situation. And the big point here is that particle filtering can make up for a model. It can help, help us deal with the limitations of a model that has a lot of uncertainties and still allow us to project forward, for example, or, or ask what if questions in the near future in a way that performs pretty well and makes up for those limitations with them all. It's not perfect, and we don't want to put a, use it as a band-aid where surgery is required. We don't want to use it to make up for a bad model. And one of the philosophical quandaries that come in with, uh, with particle filtering is, how do we use it so it doesn't shortchange our learning in the model? How do, we, how do we use it so we don't blind ourselves to the need to improve the model? Because after all, if it's constantly correcting model state, the understanding of model state in a big way, you know, are we going to be just, just dealing again with a Band-Aid solution for something sort of, you know, cleaning up the mess when we really should be dealing with, with a model that's more grounded in its structure where it doesn't need such big state updates. And particle filtering does allow us to explore this through multiple models now, but um, in an automated way, we're going to be working at this in terms of PMCMC and selecting multiple models. But always there should be a, a manual process involved in trialing these things. Xiao Yan spoke about it eloquently yesterday when asked, which is she really feels that working with the model, trialing things out, it lets you develop this intuition for what's going on and when the model's got real problems and when it's basically solid, it just needs tuning. Um, that, that's very important for modeling as an enterprise. We don't want to just you know, set up a particle filter for a new emerging virus and you know, shut the door and let the data center handle everything. We want to keep our mental models updated as well. And we want to have our mental models 
recognize when we're way off base, not merely correct, and, and have a patchwork way of recorrecting an earlier model. So this is one of the philosophical things I, I uh, must say that, you know, coming to terms with, with particle filtering. How to use it so we're not obscuring our need to rethink a model in a deeper way. And I do believe it's compatible with the need to learn in a deeper way. It's just uh, we will fool ourselves if we think it's entirely going to be an automated enterprise with particle filtering. So that's one thing I wanted to say. A second thing I wanted to say is that when it comes to particle filtering, we talk about it learning over time from the data with respect to dynamic parameters and model state. And at, at the level of intuition for what particle filtering is doing, I think it's very important to know that particle filtering works not by, not by having any particle whose understanding of the world is changed as a result of an observation. Particles are stubborn creatures. They have a view of the world. There's an observation. Their view may be way off from what their view of what should be going on now may be very off from what the observation suggests is going on. But they never change their view of the world. They're kind of bald headed in this regard. That particle doesn't change its understanding for what's going on in the world by itself. It doesn't learn. That particle does not learn by itself. Particle filtering learns from this observation. Particle filtering learns you know, what's going on in the world and better adapts its understanding to match that. But it's not a particle that does that. The particle doesn't change its expectation at all. The particle just gets downweighted or upweighted. <laughs> that, that part of the distribution gets emphasized or de-emphasized. That particle may die out in the collection of particles because it is stubborn, obstinate, truculent, and stuck in its perception of the world. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't accord with these observations for the world, and that particle gets a lower weight and eventually disappears from, from resamp by resampling. It gets a lower weight, so it's less represented in the distribution anyway, regardless of whether it actually disappears. But the point is that it's not the particles that learn. It's not like particle says, oh, I'm way off base, I better update my understanding of state. It's not that way at all. There's no way to do that in this, this model. What happens is that the particles that are better performing, those get rewarded. And it shifts its emphasis about what's going, the particle filtering shifts its emphasis on what's going on in the world, its understanding towards those particles that perform well. And those that don't perform well, that are stuck in their truculent ways, they tend to die out or become insignificant in the distribution because they have such low weights. So particle filtering learns from the world not because any one particle filter updates its estimates uh, it, to accord with the observations. It learns because of an ensemble type learning where those elements of the ensemble, those particles that are more consistent with the world, are given more credence, right? That's a very important point. So don't look in the particle filtering for where the particle updates its estimate based on the observation. It's not there. There, there ain't no place in the particle filtering model that it does that. Where there is, what you find in the particle filtering model is the weight update that basically reflects greater credence being given, greater believability, and ultimately greater representation being given to particles which are in accordance with the world. I got a question in my talk some weeks ago, uh, uh, and so it was it was about this issue, and I, I, I just corrected one thing about it. But I got a question on: Does the like likelihood function does it matter if the likelihood function um, only uses certain aspects of model state? May, or let, let me put it this way: Suppose the observed data. It's just about one little part of the model. Um, does that limit our ability to particle filter? And the answer is no, 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 no. It doesn't limit it. it so typically, the data we have from the world is about, it, it, it relates to one little piece of the model directly. 
A particle filter and uses that to prefer particles that are consistent with that observation from the world. And you may say, well, how does that tell us anything about the rest of the model? How does that tell us anything about the rest of the system if we're just preferring particles in as much as they accord with this particular little area of the system, say, the number of symptomatic cases of this area? How does that tell us about asymptomatic cases? How does that tell us about the number of people who are recovered or the number of people who are susceptible or um, getting infected through totally different pathways? How, do, how does it tell us anything? We're just observing this thing from the little bit of the world. Well, ladies and gentlemen, think back to those earlier examples. Think back to that example where I showed you, you know, hairs versus lengths on a graph. And then I showed you hairs versus hairs at time t, hairs at t and versus hairs at time t minus one. And it was basically the same graph just stretched in a certain way. In these complex systems, what goes on at one point tells us a lot about what goes on at another point. Um, uh, in terms of the, the, the drivers that drive that. But more than that, the logic of the model means that, as, as Cheyenne showed yesterday, um, Cheyenne, in, in one very important part of her presentation, said, look, um, learning about latent state is one of the most valuable features of this model. There are par if there are particles that have accorded with successively successive observations of no cases, no cases, no cases for successive times, right? Over time, there this, there's this period where there are no cases coming out. Chayen showed in one of her graphs that that was the same, that was contemporaneous with, that was the same basic time period where there were a growing number of susceptibles. You might say, well, <coughs> wait a minute, our observations were not about susceptibles. Our observations were about cases. How is it magically preferring, how is it magically know there's more susceptibles? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if we have a stock and flow model, I actually have a picture of this, so I, I might as well <coughs> just, just show it, right? Um, so I'll just, uh, forgive me if I, if I uh, rush forward in, in some of these slides that we'll be going through. But if we have a model, um, and I actually have some hidden, hidden slides here, so I will, I will go find such a diagram and a hidden slide. But if we have a model that involves SEIR, so it's an SEIR model, oh no, here we go, okay, hey, that's, that's not bad, um, this will do. Um, if we have a susceptible infected recovered model, um, and imagine that we have births into susceptibles, okay? So imagine there's further a birth thing here. Um, and so there's a, a birth uh, line into here. Maybe I'll, I'll stick it in, just so you don't have to imagine it, right? Um, okay, there's a flow into susceptible. Just put an arrow on it, we'll be happy. Um, so this means there's births coming into susceptibles and some of these susceptibles get infected, right? The particles that, that are selected that s successfully match very few cases occurring and are therefore upweighted or are therefore selected during those times where there were very few cases, of, uh, very few incident cases. Those particles will have had, by definition, an expectation of few new infections and so in the in their representation of model state, there's very few infections occurring. If very few infections occur in those particles, remember the particles are simulating this model over time. If very few new infections are occurring, of necessity, susceptibles will have to be going up. Why will it have to be going up? Because the outflow is basically zero. Maybe those particles were saying there'll be one person or two people. But basically, new infections are zero, and are, 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 are essentially zero, almost zero. Some of them will be expecting zero through the stochastics. Remember, Salyan's model had the stochastics along this associated with infection. So some of them might be expecting zero, um, that Poisson process there. So particles that have very few cases of new infections will have very little outflow. What's going to be going on with those particles in terms of inflow? Births. Lots of babies are being born during this time. 
lots of babies are being born historically during that time. And so those particles that posit very few new infections will be over the course of those months, successive months where there are very few new infections, there will be babies coming into susceptibles that will be growing the number of susceptibles. There's no two ways about it. Any particle that has few new infections, given the birth rate seen in that model, will have a growing number of susceptibles. So by selecting particles that correctly predict very few new infections in Shaoyan's model, we are selecting particles that have growing number of susceptibles over time because that is in the nature of things. It's of the nature of this model that if you have few new infections as the, you know, the night follows the day, you're gonna have growing number of susceptibles. And as a result, you're gonna have those particles realizing that you know, a bad moon will be arising. There's gonna be a growing number of susceptibles will be more and more at risk of an outbreak. And that's how in her model, those particles know to anticipate a coming outbreak after that period of very few infections. This is profoundly different, ladies and gentlemen, profoundly different than a curve fitting approach, where you say very few recent cases, very few recent cases, very few recent cases, very few recent cases, so therefore we should expect very few recent cases in the future. This is a mechanistic model. It is selecting particles that are savvy to the fact that very few new infections that have occurred means a change in model state growing susceptibles. Because remember, each particle is a full representation of count of susceptibles, count of infections, count of recoveries, and those that have few new infections will have growing number of, part of, of susceptibles over time. So it's gonna grow savvy to the fact that we're coming up on a time where we're more and more likely to be able to have a big outbreak because of the number of susceptibles is growing. The tinder in the woods is becoming dry. Uh, and we're, we're you know, subject to a spark. Will it be able to predict exactly when it will occur? No. Maybe some of these say, oh, I think it's gonna be the next month, but, but it turns out through stochastics it doesn't happen, and those particles that predict that by the vagaries of the stochastics in the model will be rewarded, and they're gonna have more susceptibles. And each month there'll be particles crying you know, crying wolf, but um, the ones that are not crying wolf will be rewarded and will be growing number of susceptibles and collectively more and more particles will then be expecting an outbreak. And that's why we saw such nice anticipatory patterns and that's why Xiao Yan was able to present that ROC curve where particles can predict so well what's gonna be coming in the coming month in terms of an outbreak or not, which is a very, very impressive result. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, in a coupled system, in a coupled system such as this, a very simple one, much less more complex one, measuring something here from the world about new infections tells you about things elsewhere in the model. It tells you about areas of the model that affect this, like upstream factors like susceptible. And for me, this is a profound strength of particle filtering. These little observations from the world, which we might take in isolation and say, yeah, okay, we know about infections from the world, but we really wish we knew about the number of susceptibles out there. They go together, ladies and gentlemen. They go together. And they go together through logic described in a model such as this. Does that make sense to people? That while we may think we're just observing uh, infectives, we're just observing a subset of infectives, it, it illuminates through the logic of the model these other areas of the model. These other areas of the system. That thing we saw with delay embedding, hairs at T, hairs at T minus one, is just a reflection of the fact that in coupled systems, what you see at one place tells you about the rest of the system. And what you see here at New Infections, at Xiaoyan's results are another demonstration of what you see at New Infections tells you about susceptibles. And ladies and gentlemen, I will have to say, in my view, this is singularly awesome about these approaches. Yes, Simon. In the observed data, if you're seeing any um, any like time series features 
so either, either lags or ACFs or PACFs, yeah. is, it, is it beneficial to let the par particles figure that out or to build into the dynamic structure? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, so uh, the question, uh, in case the, the microphone doesn't, uh, didn't capture it, um, uh, concerned if you have uh, time series in the data which exhibit um, uh, features uh, with respect to you know, there's some, uh, for example, lagging going on or, or autocorrelation functions which capture certain characteristics um, in the data. Um, do you want to build that into the system or, or should the model be able to, to anticipate um, those, those features? Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question and um, it will take me a moment to unpack that into my head because there's no question, um, there's no question that observations from the world um, uh, are, are sometimes delayed in the data, for example, that Shaoyan is working with. So in Shaoyan's model, um, one thing she, she didn't show because it's a kind of minor detail in her diagrams of the system is there's actually a stock in her model whose job it is to total up over the course of the current month and at the end of the month that becomes the past month, the number of incident cases so that it's reported at month's end. So when she's looking at reported cases per month, it's actually reported cases over the past month, right? There's, there's a kind of delay there of on average two weeks before a case is considered. And the model captures that automatically in its state estimates. It's not, it's not something that requires any sort of building into the model because we have a model structure that captures that delay. That delay is implicit in the data we observe from the world, that there is this delay in reporting. Um, and, and that ends up um, all sort of coming out in the wash. It all, it all uh, comes through. Um, OK. Now, that's a little bit different. So, so this is really interesting. So say we took the mosquito example. Yeah. Where we understand the seasonality of mosquitoes life yeah. cycle so that we could build that into that right. even that linear regression model to understand yeah. the probability of capture if that yeah. had a seasonality component to it. Right. Then it could potentially increase. I agree with you. I agree with you. That that would seem to um, seem to make sense but like seasonality in a mosquito's life cycle will probably be built into the dynamic model underlying it. Because there's a dynamic model involving the population size. And then there's the observation model involving if I measure a mosquito today, what's my, or if I have a trap out to catch mosquitoes today, what's the probability that I will catch, catch a mosquito, so you know, in the surrounding area? So sort of the the, the mosquito, mosquito prince's understanding of the system might have been inferred from seasonality, which then informed the model from the base structure, rather than explicitly building it in. To the, I, I, you wouldn't want to build it into the observation model. Yeah. If you were to build it in, the implications of it go into the, the model of the dynamics of the system. Yeah. But you know, I, I, I would like, you, I don't feel I'm, I'm either answering your question well, nor do I feel I am fully positioned, because I think it's a deep question. And I'm gonna ask Shaoyan to think about this for a moment. Let's suppose that the data, so, so this is the case I'm grappling with, and maybe it's not what you meant to ask, but it's been on my mind for a little bit. Let's suppose that you are operating with a particle filter. Um, and let's suppose you receive data from, in this case, public health authorities concerning new infectives periodically. On, it's, it's monthly data, and you receive it on a monthly basis. However, suppose that that data that you receive, to, to be absurd about it, 
although I think it's less absurd than one would think for reasons articulated by Cheryl earlier. Suppose that data that you receive monthly is the data from last year of this month, or something like that. So, you know, in December, you receive, December 2019, you receive data from 2000, December 2018. And suppose you are trying to predict, you know, what's going to happen in January 2019, but you only have data to December 2018. Um, how would that affect how would you capture that best in a model? I mean, conceptually, I don't see any big problem that we're only operating on past data. Um, uh, and then we would, I guess, simulate forward from December. So we'd be progressing the model forward as new data comes in to, say, December 2018. Um, incorporate that new data point. It sharpens our understanding of the latent state as it was in 2018. And then we need to project forward to December 2019 and January 2020 to sort of anticipate what's the case now. And we'd be operating off of old data doing that from 2018, but that's just, that's all we got. And we might get estimates for January 2020, which are, you know, not great uh, for the product of Bill 30. They're a lot better than <laughs> would be if they were just on our head or a calibrated model. But they, they're operating with old data. But you know, there's not a not a problem with that. I don't think we need to build anything into the model that it, that explicitly takes that into account. It's just that we're gonna be getting longer projections. Um, longer projections uh, back, um, you know, longer projections that end up leading to not, you know, less less effective model projections than if we got the data about December 2018 and 2019 at the end of 2019, just at the end of the month. Um, and this actually comes, becomes quite relevant for Chen Yang's data because the mosquito data, I think they received back mosquito infectivity estimates. So they, so they get these mosquito traps and they bring them back. They have people go retrieve them, they bring them back to the lab. And then they sort them by hand, the different types of mosquitoes. And then mosquitoes of a certain sort, they put into a test tube and it's sent to the prof lab. And I think they get those results back in two weeks about whether it was infective. Um, and so this would be a, a real case where you might be operating off of infectivity data from two weeks ago. You might be operating off mosquito count data from a week or from from a week ago, say, and, and maybe infectivity data from or you know. Uh, count data from a few days, uh, yeah, anyway, um, from a shorter period of time ago and then from a longer time ago for infectivity, the today kid to your particle filter model. And uh, you might find it's not as accurate as it would be, you know, if you had most recent data infectivity perfectly. And you could do a value of information type approach in the sense of saying, if we had data, do a simulation model you know, about some underlying synthetic ground truth model. If we had data from, you know, that was current, you could actually do it with historic data nicely. If we had data immediately about infectivity or say within a few days instead of two weeks, how much better could our model projections be in anticipating the mosquito population over the next week? So I'm not sure this was your question, but I'm struggling with thinking these things through. And my, my sense is that you don't have to do jury breaking of the model, and I, I, I don't see a need to sort of build in a, 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 you know, a, a lot of complicated lagging structure or to take into account ACFs directly and so on. But maybe we can talk about this separately. Great question. Other questions before I dive into some, some new material on this? We're going to see, yes, sure. Um, Two big meaning of life questions, and you don't have to answer both of them now, but I just wanted to throw them out there. Uh, I get the sense that this works better with simpler models versus more really complicated models, part in part from the discussion yesterday where you, you were talking about multiple age groups, but certainly yeah. you know how complicated yeah. some of my existence is. Um, the first one is sort of some idea around how simple the model needs to be for this to work well. And then the second thing kind of relates to that, how much data, how much time series data do you need to make this work? So 
Um, is there any sort of an idea of, of how mm. much information you actually need mm. to, to use this method? Mm. Great questions. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take my shot very briefly at, at both of them. Um, so I'll, I'll address the, the second one first. Um, amount of data, there's been some interesting work that we've done involving, I, I don't think we've done our homework with respect to the amount, like the length of the time series. My sense is that, that it starts to learn pretty quickly. So if you had even a short time series, you get some benefit. If you have a long time series, you'll get more benefit. And you know, I, I'm not saying anything profound there. What I will tell you, though, is that um, the, the uh, temporal density, the velocity, seems to matter a lot. So we have these models, which I'm actually not going to be emphasizing this time, but there's some good papers on them. Um, uh, where if you double, let's suppose you, you have a model, a particle filter model, where you have data coming in from the world, and you double the frequency with which you get that data. So it's, you double the velocity, right? You, you're getting estimates every half week instead of every week. Um, it turns out that the error observed for that model, at least for, for the model we examined, condition we examined, um, the, the range of timing we examine, the error goes down by more than a factor of two. So you might go down by a factor of six, even though you only double the, the velocity. And so what that's saying is, at least for certain ranges, it pays to measure it more frequently. And I think velocity is one of these key factors that plays a big role, because like if if Xiao Yan, actually this is something I think Xiao Yan has done quite well, and I would refer you to her awesome master's thesis. Um, uh, so she has done work examining what's the effect, for example, if you only add yearly data versus you had yearly and monthly. But it was somewhat caught up there because the monthly data is aggregate in character, it's not age specific and the early data is. Um, an interesting question will come up. Maybe Shayan has done something like this. Um, you know, if, if she were to take, maybe she has, yeah, maybe she's done something like this. If she were to take the data at an aggregate level for the entire year, instead of taking it monthly, take aggregate data for the year and, and no age specific data, how would that affect modeling filter accuracy? Um, so you are only observing things once a year based on the total number of cases in that year, rather than observing monthly. Oh, I, I have done only incorporated the, the age group. Yeah. That's um, right. kind of more terrible than only, <laughs> only incorporated the monthly data right. without the yearly age group. Right. That's the worst one. Right. Yeah. Um, the worst one you're saying is is if you only have aggregate once a year. Uh, two age groups a year. Oh, two age groups. Yeah. So if you have aggregate once a year versus aggregate monthly, and that's all the data you have, how bad would the results become in a year? Like if you only had it once a year. I didn't run uh, for the aggregate yearly data, but yeah. I can guess if, if the yearly yeah. data is aggregated. I think it will be more worse. Yeah. yeah, because it's going to be over the course of a year, um, it, it, the particle filter could get a lot more fuzzy about what things will do, you know, yeah. uh, and late in the year particularly. And then it will be corrected, but it will be corrected um, in a way that reflects incidents over the past year. Yeah. And so I think it will be, I think it will be materially, uh, Lesson. That this is why particle filter is such an ideal match to high velocity data. Is is you know it, it pays. I think it, it pays. And from this other model that's published, um, we um, you know we, we found that it, it reduced it disproportionately, like more than linearly. Um, uh, 
so you know, as I said, doubling the frequency uh, more than it, it, it uh, reduces error by more than a factor of two, and significantly more. So that's the second question. The first question is, you get the impression that this works better for smaller models. I think, so in my view, the jury is still a little bit out on this, and I'll tell you why. It has to do a lot with what we're talking about, that, that when it comes to complex systems, you have to draw a sharp distinction between the nominal dimensionality of the model. So it has 100 stocks, and so you say it's 100 times larger state space than a model with, well, one stock, yeah. So say two stock model versus a 200 stock model, 100 times larger state space. You, you might think, you need 100 times as much data to estimate it. It doesn't work that way because models are coupled and and knowing about one stock will tell you about a lot of the other stocks and if you look at how these models evolve in state space you'll find that there's a nominal dimensionality of state space maybe 200 dimension but the intrinsic dimensionality the amount that it actually explores of that state space might be of dimensionality three or two or four um, it's vastly smaller and it occupies this thin shell within a much broader space, much as, you know, a, a piece of paper like this, oh, a piece of paper like this occupies, you know, a, a two-dimensional sort of surface and three space, right? This is a three-dimensional space, but this actually occupies that. And a lot of our models just go on this manifold, and so, one of the things that this tells you is, you know, um, in, in three space here, um, go if I go, uh, if I consider my three axes, right, x, y, z, um, uh, then, you know, going this way will tell me, if I, if I consider this axis, it will tell me a lot about, about how the, if, if I, all I know is this, well, <coughs> I can predict how far up it is because I, you know, I know that it, it sort of curves upwards as you go this way, the, the value along this axis will rise. And so, and this is the nature of coupled systems, that knowing about, you know, something here tells us a lot about the other. So the actual amount of information separately in the state space is vastly reduced because it's coupled. And the more coupling it is, the more small the actual occupation of, of the state space. Um, and that's like we saw with that Harrison Lynx's. We saw the big 2D space, but we actually saw it was occupying only a small, essentially 1D sort of orbit within that space. There's all this space, you know, out, out in these nether regions. Um, where's my favorite one? Um, okay. uh, so there's all this Oh gosh, horrible. You can see, you can see why. So the definition of nerd when I was at MIT was someone who cared about, who was interested in everything in the world except how to dress. Um, and I always thought that was pretty appropriate for me. Um, so I'm not very good at color, sorry. Um, this looks like a different color. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's different. Um, um, so, uh, so you know, there's all this space out here which is totally unoccupied, um, uh, and um, you know, there's all this space in here that's totally unoccupied. What you're really dealing with is a one-dimensional. It's just kind of bent around, but it's a one-dimensional sliver of this. And so it is with these complex systems because what goes on here influences so much what goes on elsewhere. You know, um, these take mean that there are fewer people to to uh, there's more people around who are recovered already, and therefore um, there's more duds in terms of contacts from from infectives that that don't you know there's seeds that go on stony ground, and you don't actually get new infections from them, and so so these are very coupled systems. What goes on here ends up affecting how many people are coming into recovered over time, and and so you end up having such small occupation of that space that um, 
I think it may depend a lot on model dynamics, like how how hard it is to estimate from the data. Because it's, if it's a highly coupled system, if it involves really tightly coupled components, maybe a smaller amount of data will be just fine. I suspect it will be. By contrast, if you have a model which has lots of solitudes, you know, you're simulating influenza on different islands or whatever, and you only have a few pieces of data, um, you have a low coupled system and therefore you have low, you know, comparatively high dimensionality of the space and you can't pin it down with less data. So Cheryl, I, I think it is true by and large, more articulated models have larger state space, but I don't think it goes up linearly. And uh, we have empirically had more success with this with small models, but in a way that's been because we've been looking for the keys where the light is, which is, you know, we've been doing small small models because they're they're comparatively easier to do. And now Xiaoyan's work um, particularly is extending this to, uh, to richer models. Um, and we have some fairly successful work with PMCMC that's extended to larger models. Um, that PMCMC model, uh, Xiaoyan, 70 stocks? Yeah, yeah, I think 56 to 70. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah around 70. But um, I, I, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're at a scientific level we're at a place where we can comment you know about with clarity about all these all these issues. What I'll say is it's a non-obvious issue, and I think it requires study. But coupling two key criteria are the size of the model, the amount of uh, three point three key criteria, size of the model the amount of data, and the coupling of the model. I think those all are going to play a big role in shaping, are you going to be able to estimate this well? One thing that is clear from Cheyenne's work is it doesn't always help to have a more detailed model, which even though the dynamics in the model may be more accurate, it's not. it doesn't give you more, um, more precision in the model expectation. Yes, I love you. Sorry, just on the note of Cheryl, what she's talking about is, if I understand the question correctly, is that the, the particle filtering is like applied well for like the simple like, systems. Is that, was that? Yeah, so is that the reason why that at the moment we're limited by that? That's why particle filtering is not quite explored in Asian-based model. Because I know one time uh, one of your grad students tried to do particle filtering on Asian-based model, and although the result is optimistic, but it's not as good as system dynamic model. Correct. That's because the nature of the Asian-based model is is the interaction among agents is much more complicated, and I think of like Asian-based model, the the amount of agents. Usually, a large number of agents that will stimulate each other. Yeah, yeah. So, a great question, and uh, at at a it's it's a great question. I actually have lecture some slides related to this, but um, I'll just comment the basic issues here. I was just saying to Cheryl about the considerations carry over to agent based models as well. But the the the, the challenge or the there's more scientific questions there. The, that result that we saw earlier, you, you're right that its results were mixed. Um, it, was not ter it was not impressive results per se, but it gave a lot of understanding and, and there's kind of a, a joint understanding by myself and the, the main lead on that, Kurt Kruger, my PhD student at the time, which um, uh, which suggests that um, uh, you know much of the reasons of the limitations we saw is the data that we had. So we were trying to estimate the state of that model, which involved lots of distinct agents, but we were trying to do so with data that was purely aggregate, right? It was aggregate totaled up a lot, across lots of agents, and. And it's kind of a blunt type of data if you're trying to estimate the state of different agents, right? Um, and so there's a lot of ambiguity there. Um, and, you know, um, 
if we had had some data at an individual level, uh, like from some sentinels, maybe we could have done better. But you're right that the results um, needed were were not hugely impressive. Um, another thing that got in the way there, per my comments earlier, is it's it's harder. It, it just there's more. There's like ten times as much work to do it with an nature-based model. Um, and I won't go into it, but there's a, a lot of work to build that HMA's modeling framework that'll support particle filtering, and we did it. And you know we can do it again. I mean, we're computer scientists here, but but it it, it takes a lot of work, and um, and so we haven't done as much subsequent experimentation. One of my hopes over the next year is to really do that more, and um, I I have a student. Um, who might be exploring that Paul Lamp um, as part of his master's thesis. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's scientific questions about how effective that will be. And I think the same basic issue is whole. Because if it's, a, if it's an angel based model, which has a lot of coupled dynamics, knowing about one part of it will often tell you a lot about the other parts of it, and, um, and maybe less data will be fine. Uh, uh, on the other hand, every particle in an HMX model that's being particle filtered has a complete representation of the model state, right? So every particle has a representation. Person A is, is currently in this infection state. Person B is in that one. Person C is in that one. And another particle says, no, I think person C is recovered now. Um, uh, and, and if you're only dealing with the aggregate data, there's a lot of ambiguity as, you know, is it A who's infected, or is it B who's infected? Or maybe it's C, you know, another particle of the seventh, some thinks it's D, um, which is awfully ambiguous. And so there's a lot of particles that can have very reasonable representations of what's going on. And um, when it comes to judging model results, sometimes that matters and sometimes it doesn't. So I think scientifically this needs to be studied more. Yeah. So you just on the note that you were saying each particles will record every individual agent. Yeah. So would that the size of the vectors that we look at? Size of vector big. Yeah, for the big. also would be big. It's it a, well it's a big it's a big vector and because it, it has in theory it has the state of every agent, right? Yeah. So in that, that vector. I'm so sorry to keep Yeah, going. no, no, it's fine. Would that affecting the behavior of particle filtering? If, um, the, if, the, if the vector itself is very, very big. Mumble, I mean, yes, <laughs> it will affect it some. Um, it, necessarily, it won't necessarily affect it really badly. Uh, it'll be performance-wise, it'll, it'll take a bunch. But again, I mean, in a coupled system, what you know about one part will tell you a lot. And, you know, if you know, you know, or these people have a raging flu infection, it'll tell you, those people probably have a high chance of being infected and, and so on. And so, um, you know, it's, yes, it's, 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 it's a big vector and, and it's, if you only have data about how many total of people, count of people that are infected, there's going to be a lot of ambiguity who it is, mm -hmm. right? Who it is that's infected. And so there will be some ambiguity. Now, in your case, where you have, you have the agents being blocks of, of crust, oceanic and continental crust. Um, uh, uh, you know, and you have data about particular parts of crust. Like this is where diamonds were formed by a hot spot that was in this region of southern Africa at this spot or something. Um, you actually have data at an individual level, which will really pin that down greatly, I think. And that's and if we have data from smartphones, um, so, uh, so if you have data from smartphones, that can inform you as to what's going on at an individual level and start to you know, pin down the pieces. That, that can be very helpful to, to really collapse the ambiguity, I think, that Kurt was dealing with in his thesis, where he just had counts of people, and there's any number of different combinations of people that could have been infected to be consistent with that data. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Shreem. Yeah, I'm just wondering, 
uh, yeah, first uh, for, for the agent based model, I think um, generally maybe for individual data that you have, right? Generally, but for the collective behavior, you don't have observations, right? That's, that's the limitation, right, for using particle uh, filter. Well, um, I mean, sometimes uh, you have the reverse situation, like with Kurt's case, what you, uh, and maybe I'm, I, I, I misheard the question, but um, like sometimes in the world we have aggregate observations, right? Like we have total counts of people infected. We have an age-based model we're seeking to use to explore mechanisms about why we see that, but we might not have data at an individual level. And so, uh, you know, we, we have a mechanistic model that tries to tries to understand why we see these aggregate patterns, but the data is aggregate in character. And if, 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 if we're trying to particle filter that agent-based model, each particle will have a complete state of that model, you know, uh, associated with it. And you're trying to infer, if you're trying to infer just from aggregate data, like total number of cases or reported cases, what's going on at an individual level, there'll be a lot of ambiguity there. Right, right. There'll be a lot of ambiguity. And so, in my view, um, one of the most important, one of the most valuable things, certainly for cutting through that ambiguity, is if you had some individual data, it, even if it was data on, you know, number of people who presented, it was some statistical like number of people presented, who've only presented once or twice or three times or four times or five times for successive, say, chlamydia infection or something, or, or you know, sort of recurrent infection, or if it's um, uh, some some information about sentinel groups uh, within the population. I think that would collapse the uncertainty a lot. But there's there's just um, yeah there's a lot of uncertainty about who's infected if you only have aggregate data. And you know if if your model has an agent based population, you have if you have hubs and you have non hubs. People who are in a tight dense network. With, with lots of connections and people are not, and all you see is a total count, um, um, there'll be an ambiguity as to, is it a hub that's infected or not? Now, if you start to see a sudden rise in number of infections, an explosion, then probably the particle filter could figure out, oh, the hub got infected, and now it's spread. So it's not to say it's hopeless, it's just, amongst other things, it does require to, to open to, to, to further that answer to Cheryl, it requires more particles. Because you have to have, you have a lot more hypotheses that are needed to, to reasonably densely cover the set of possibilities. So you need a lot more particles. Okay, the, the second comment uh, on the previous uh, concern, just you mentioned the, uh, you, uh, using the monthly data or yearly data, or that, does that uh, yeah. uh, decrease effects of part particle filtering. So it depends on what kind of objects you are um, studying. For, uh, mm -hmm. for example, for most of the uh, for, uh, the, the uh, infectious disease, maybe you have very uh, short period of uh, incubation time. Right? right. Maybe you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to use yearly data, right? That's actually the correct. Correct, yes. Meaning. Absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, but for other, um, uh, disease such as uh, here is one it's hard to pronounce. Um, e uh, e caucus. Ah. Huh? Okay, yeah. I, I'm I'm new Parasite. to that. It, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of it has maybe several years to, to maybe thirty years of kind of incubation period. Right. So like TB would be another example, very long latent period. Right. But, but at this level, if you have enough data, so yeah. see maybe. Right, fifty years or sixty yeah. years data. Yeah. I mean, still that year data is kind of couldn't agree more. And yeah, we actually yeah. have some models for TB with particle filtering mm -hmm. that show quite good results. Right. But it, understandably, there you're not going to see a big benefit if you have, you know, weekly data compared to monthly, probably for those longer term case infection. You will see some because about half are sooner cases, you, you will see some ranges where it may make a difference, but probably weekly versus monthly it's not going to make, because it spreads so slowly. Right. And you'll hear about this some from Winchell tomorrow right. in some of his simulations. But um, uh, but yeah, I think that's, that's uh, a very good point, that it depends on the 
time constants associated with the natural processes you're trying to characterize. Mm -hmm. right. So if those are very fast, having commensurately high velocity data will be very valuable. By contrast, if it spreads very slowly, you know, it's, it's uh, gilding the lily. It's, it's unnecessary to have very, very fast sample data because it doesn't materially improve your ability to anticipate what's likely to happen in the next little bit. So, so very good, very good. Okay, I think we'll stop for a break right now, and then I will go on. I'm gonna include a further example where I've, I've taken time to try to spell out in more detail. I love yesterday's examples, but here I want to break it down a little bit more specifically about how we made certain choices for likelihood functions, how we made um, certain choices for the uh, structure of handling multiple types of data, about the, the vector associated with states, et cetera, so that you can see it at a little bit closer of a level if you want to implement it yourself, okay? So we'll do that after the break. Um, but meanwhile, we'll take uh, 10 minutes here. Thank you very much. I love these questions. I'm so grateful for all the questions I'm getting. They are awesome.